Welcome, everyone. I am very pleased and thank you for being here for the American Warrior Social and Guest Speaker Program. During the social, I hope you took time to reconnect with folks that you may have already known, maybe met some new people, browsed the information tables, and of course, gotten something to eat and drink. I am Emma Toops. I am the Executive Chair of American Warriors here at the ACA Business Club, and I am your MC for tonight's program. Here's the agenda. I will do a quick introduction of American Warriors, introduce our event sponsors, and then introduce each of our speakers in turn and serve as their timekeeper. After the transition stories, I will present on solving the transition puzzle, followed by some, some recognitions, event announcements, and then wrap up by uh, drawing for audience gifts. First, I'll give you an introduction to American Warriors. American Warriors is a special interest group of the ACA Business Club, which is a private club with the philosophy that business flows out of relationships. People do business with people that they know, like, and trust. Thus, members of the club are committed to creating solid connections by learning and practicing the fundamentals of strategic networking and relationship building. American Warriors are club members who have an affinity with or support those who have served our country in military or public service. The mission statement for American Warriors is to provide educational and networking opportunities for patriotic citizens who are leaders in business and support the transition into private and public sector business of active duty service members and first responders. American Warriors participate in regular activities each month, which include a facilitated discussion roundtable, which can be attended in person or through Zoom, the Purple Connection, which is an educational networking event on Zoom, this semi-annual social and guest speaker program, and individual support as applicable. We always welcome participation of other ACA club members and their guests who wish to learn or engage with people in the military and military support communities. Our event sponsors are those who support the event to cover operational expenses and provide marketing and communication, food, drink, and audience gifts. All are active in military or military support activities. Some are members of the ACA club, the Kansas City AUSA chapter, the Olathe Chamber, or are a community connection. We truly appreciate their support as they enable us to organize and conduct this event. I'll recognize a named representative of each sponsor during our recognition segment, but for now I'm going to introduce the companies who are our sponsors. A Castle on a Hill, Tubes Consulting, 31 Gifts, BJ Productions, Park Place Payments, Lucas and Associates, Brand and Go, Prime Lending, Exit Momentum, the Mission Hills Chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, and Sharon K. Keller of Keller Williams uh, Realty Partners. Now, I'll get the guest speaker program underway. Our first speaker is Patrice Manuel, a Cold War era Army veteran. Her transition story includes coming home after 20 years of active duty service, project management with Sprint, starting a business as a single mom in her basement, and providing program and project management to the public and private sectors. My name is Patrice Manu. I'm the owner of P Strata. P Strata is a management consulting company in Kansas City. We started off, the P stands for Patrice, and my mom says, well, name it something cute like Strata. I said, well, what does that mean? She goes, I don't know, but it sounds good. <laughs> you all ever have situations like that? So I named the company P. Strata and found out that Strata, like a Strata Bahn, for people who've been to Germany and Italy, it means a roadway. So P. Strata provides an avenue for growth that's different than what the normal mainstream books will tell you. We look at what your true needs are and help you get there with an alternative growth method. And we do a lot of project management and a lot of project support. Um, I'm a retired 20-year active Army officer. And when I came in the service, we had just finished the WAC Corps. The WAC Corps, and where, would I, where was I stationed first place as a chemical officer? Fort McClellan, Alabama. So they threw me, after I graduated college, down to Fort McClellan, Alabama. And the next thing I know is I'm a chemist by trade. I'm a chemist by degree. And then they put me in the chemical corps instead of the 
the environmental stuff that I really wanted to do, you know. During this time, we had just had a movie that came out not too long and helped me in my endeavors. It was called Private Benjamin. So I was trying, <laughs> I was trying my best to get to Hawaii, and instead they sent me to Fort Hood, Texas. Cow House Creek was my home, Tank, tanks all around me. I'm like, I cannot be glamorous like this at all. Stayed in the woods, stayed in the field at least 15 days out of every month for a year as a smoke generator platoon leader. That was my first exposure in the military as a chemical officer. Um, the great part about that was is, you know, I learned how to adapt. Military teaches you how to adapt. And at some place like Fort Hood where everybody wears a green outfit, adapting is one of the greatest skills that the military gives you in your leadership ability is to adapt to that environment. So the greatest part about being in the military was there was a sense of camaraderie. I was a single parent during my last 10 years in the service. And the greatest part about that is that the families, the women, the community gathers you and keeps you. And that's probably the greatest thing that I realized about my military service, besides, you know, getting yelled at. You know, I never had been yelled at like, you know, when someone stands you at attention and they just chew you out real good. And then you say, sir, may I have permission to speak? He says, what is it? I said, you are good at this. You are so good. Get out of my office. Yes, sir. I learned how to not take it personal. You got to get to a point where you don't take it personal. It's the job. Get it done. Get it done. I said, okay, I'm getting ready to get out. I'm getting ready to get out. So I was going to do 18 million things. My mother said, don't tell me till you do it. You know, I'm going to go work here. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. I'm going to go make 150 k a year. You all know those feelings when you get ready. I'm jumping out. They're going to transition this real well. I went to a couple of the transitions courses, but I made up my mind I wasn't going to work for anyone. Ooh. You know, I am going to get out here and make a whole bunch of money and do my thing. My last duty station was Fort Lost in the Woods. I mean, Fort Leonard Wood. I was down at Fort Leonard Wood for my last duty assignment. And in the military, my secondary was um, project management and acquisition. The military was so great at making me look at research and development. So I was doing research and development for what the Army wanted to do for 2010 and beyond. I had companies like Battelle saying, hey, you can come work for us. I'm like, you're going to start me at the bottom of the list. I know how y'all do. You're not going to start me off that's going to make me feel good about what I do. You're just going to tell me to go do a bunch of work. I know. Now I need to think. I wanted the opportunity to just really think and be creative. So coming out of the military, Kansas City is home, and I came back home. My family drove me nuts. My family wanted me to take sides, pick who was going to do what. Well, Miss So-and-so, your cousin said this. Well, what do you think about it? I said, I love y'all all. I I don't want to get in the weeds with this. Keep me on a higher level. Just wish me well. So I came home, and I started working as a consultant for Sprint doing project management work. That was getting back into another cookie-cutter box for me, and I wasn't really good at it. I did it for a period of time, but it felt like when I was working with Sprint that there were seven areas doing the same thing, and no one knew about it. No one knew what the other side was doing. So I'm like, you know what? I really do need to go do my own thing. So I came out and started working from home. And one of the things I learned from working from home is, you know, you pick the days you want to go out. Like I went out on Mondays. No, I went out on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So I could pick two outfits and do everything I had to do for those events. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. You pick, okay, so you all are with me. Y'all pick one or two outfits to wear to go to those events, you know. And I could go to do all the networking. And then I got to a point I said, I am working harder at networking and spending money doing stuff than I am going out making money. So then I had to reduce that and bring it down and narrow it down and understand in my mind's eye how to be quick, right, and gone. How do I make a stamp and be quick, right, and gone? Well, you know, I've already got this background with acquisition, so I understand the procurement process. I wasn't too crazy about doing anything with the government. But at that time, the, the community was not hiring small businesses to do services. I wanted to do project management work. I wanted to do uh, leadership development. I wanted to do training. But they were hiring the big companies to do all that. So then I thought about it for a while. I said, so what is it they would buy from an uh, A-day, service-disabled, woman-owned business? What would they buy? 
I know they'll buy a commodity. So while I was doing this portion of trying to sell all this, all this while I was trying to sell my wares for project management and for all these services, I picked a commodity that brought me to another level, and the commodity I picked was furniture. Why? Because a lot of small minority businesses don't own furniture franchises of furniture, furniture businesses. So I went to the Knoll plant, the Knoll facility in Pennsylvania, then I went to the headquarters in Manhattan, and I shot my wares to them and said, listen, you all need me. They go, why do we need you? I said, because I'm a woman-owned 8A, service-disabled veteran business, and I can, can get something you can't get. They said, well, what is it you can do for me that I can't do for myself? I said, I can make sure that we get paid every month. I'm your cash flow. So do you want to create cash flow to make this process work? They go, yeah. They said, well, we need you to buy a lockbox. I'm not buying a lockbox. You either trust me or you don't. This is a deal, man. You're going to do it or not. And they did it. They got my small business up so that I could do the project management work. They got it up so I could do the other things I wanted to do. I ended up selling that first year $2 million worth of furniture. Because what they did is they never had a small business attached to them in a partnership. So I'm like, yeah, we can do this. So Peace Strider was created, and I got out of the house after two years. Didn't that sound bad? I moved my business. I had skin in the game. I moved the business down to Kansas City. In that process of moving the business to Kansas City, we grew up to $10 million plus. Now, they got these tricky things when you're playing with government contracts. And when you're playing with government dollars, they say, you can't exceed 700, 700, 700K for three years consecutively. So I had to purposely scale back every other year so I could stay in the 8A program to not end up overdoing what the military, what the government dollars. Then I would be a medium-sized business and have to compete with the big guys. And I didn't want to do that. So now that world domination was already taken and I wasn't at the lead of it, I started having people in my work area that were the wrong people on the bus. And you know what that looks like? Okay, there's three ways people think they're going to make money. They're either going to sue somebody, they're either going to win the lotto, or they're going to inherit it. Most of the time, people try to sue somebody. So you're not in business unless you've been sued at least once. Okay, y'all hear me? I'm telling you, knock, knock. <laughs> All right. And so um, understanding that, I made a conscious decision with the wrong people on the bus, bus that I was going to downsize. I wasn't going to try to boil the ocean. I was bringing it home. I'm like, you know what? I've had this at home before, so I'm going to take it back home. And all these people I have working for me, I realized when I started spending more time on people issues than I did on business growth that was trying to make a change. Now, could I have stayed out there and tuck it through? Yeah, but I was getting older, and my knees were bad, and I had to have them replaced. So I'm like, I'm going home. <laughs> so I brought it all home, and it was safe, and it was okay. And I did it because I knew that I could still make a decent salary, a decent company, a decent model of HIT, which is honesty, integrity, and timeliness in all that I say and do. Now what do I do? I spend a lot of time doing a lot of international pro projects, project managing. A lot of, I have uh, one going on right now in Ghana for 10 million homes. That's a $3.8 billion contract, so I do project management work for them. I have some projects going on in the United States. I do mentoring. I love leadership development. I have people that I coach, and I am just having the, a great time. I'm traveling, visiting friends that I haven't seen in years. We're now traveling, trying to go to, okay, I got some Air Force people, so I'm taking everybody to Korea, and then they're taking everybody to Guam, and we got some people we're in Italy. We all going to Italy and hang out. And so just having that camaraderie, even back from the military to now, Hey, I'm a hot mama doing my thing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Patrice. Great story. Our next speaker is Gary Walker. He is a Cold War era Air Force veteran. His transition story includes coming home after a line of duty injury in Air Force Special Operations, entrepreneurship and commercial cleaning and uh, being an eco advocate, selling the business and um, going through some PTS and suicide ideation, and then now using art and mindfulness in helping heal veterans with PTSD. Gary, please come up and let's hear from you.
Thank you. I want to recognize my wife, Trish, uh, 39 years, okay? Yeah. So uh, that's how the story starts. I was quite the artist when I was younger. And at 15, I'd won a couple of state championships in uh, art. And then at 16, I met Trish. So guess what happened to art? Art was gone. I joined the military at, uh, at 17. Uh, Trish and I are high school sweethearts, by the way, just to add to that. And um, after I got done with all my training and came home, she had just graduated high school, and we got married. And our honeymoon was driving a U-Haul to Minot, North Dakota. So that was our first duty station. And <laughs> yeah, that was exciting. In fact, I, I got my orders, and I wouldn't share it with her because I thought, she'll never marry me. So we got up there, and I think by September we had a snowstorm, and she said, get me out of here, whatever we got to do. So put in for Worldwide Long Extended, and they sent us to Germany. Great assignment. Uh, we had our first child over there, and uh, things were going really well. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, uh, I was pulled into an undercover drug operation with the Army CID, the Polizei, and Air Force OSI. Uh, I'm a 24-year-old kid. I've had no training in how to work undercover. I don't know anything about drug operations or anything else. But the person that came to me and said, listen, I owe a drug dealer $10,000, and you know they're threatening me. And so I got involved. And uh, I ended up injuring my back, having two major back operations at Longeville Army Hospital. And by 25, I was medically retired. So my plan for 20 years of our life was just pulled from underneath me. And uh, I was sent home on a commercial flight, and Trish picked me up at the airport with our son, Zach, and I had to start all over again. I had everything just focused, planned, ready to go, and that changed. And so Trish and I uh, got jobs, because you got to do that, make money, and, and uh, I didn't like it. I just did not like working for someone which is funny because when I was in the military, you are told what to do all the time. So um, I sold Cadillacs. I was pretty good at that. Um, I sold welding supplies. Trish worked at Boatman's Bank. You guys remember Boatman's Bank uh, as a teller? Oh, stop. I know. Look at that picture up there. Someone walked by me the other day and said, thank you for serving Vietnam. I went, hey. <laughs> Wow. So, and I just said back to her, oh, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> so, anyway, um, I was working with a guy selling welding supplies, and he did floors at night. So, he'd use a buffer and buff floors out or strip and wax and everything else. And so, he asked me, do you know anything about buffers? And I'm like, yeah, in the military? Are you kidding me? They start you out on one of those things. And uh, so he said, well, come along with me, and, and we'll do some of this floor work together. And um, I went. I loved it. I had my little Walkman cassette on my hip with my headphones, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm that old. Uh, <laughs> So uh, we did the floors, and I thought, this is great, and, and so let me know when you have another job coming up. So he did, and I went, and it was at the Commerce Bank down on the plaza, and we were doing the floors, getting ready for a Christmas party, and I would watch these people come in, and they would, with a feather duster, arrange some, rearrange some dust and eat some candy off the desk and dump a trash can, and then they'd leave. And I told my friend, I'm like, Dennis, I mean, look, the desks are glass and they're all fingerprinted and messy and I'm like we need to be doing this and he said no it's five nights a week and with the floors I pick my time and so um, I told him I want to do this and he said well my cousin runs property services maybe you and Trish will go up there and have a meeting and talk to him about it and 
So we went there, and Trish and I didn't own a company. We didn't have any money. Um, but I felt this, this sure about it. And so, um, well, let me back this up. I came home at 3 o'clock in the morning from doing floors and woke Trish up to tell her what we're going to do the rest of our life. <laughs> Guys, don't do that. <laughs> Just saying. So, um, anyway... Uh, Trish and I started a janitorial company out of our garage, and uh, 20, 25 years later, we had 250 employees, and we cleaned 147 buildings in Kansas City. I, we had also started a supply business, and we had five employees on that. Uh, we had a lot of government contracts, but we had all the buildings that we cleaned. We sold them their toilet paper, paper towels, trash bag, everything. So we were diversifying our streams of income. And uh, we had Return to Green, which was the first all-green cleaning store in Kansas City. We were on the radio for three years as the King Queen of Green. So it's called Going Green with the King Queen. Uh, we were on 810 radio, and we did that. And we've just had a lot of great life experiences being serial entrepreneurs. I mean, we've owned seven companies. We're, we've sold three of them. I don't want to talk about the others. Um, <laughs> there's, there's always lessons, people. There's always lessons. So um, now we have monkey brain art. I created that logo. Thank you. So now here I am 40 years later doing the thing that I love the most, and that's art. And so Monkey Brain Art, we do art, meditation, and mindfulness to calm the warrior's unsettled mind. Trish is a certified yogi. I'm the art instructor. Um, and we're working with veterans, first responders, uh, just going out and helping them find their calm. Um, and the way we got to that was... You know, I was melting down, my PTSD was raging, and I just wasn't finding that peace, that calm. And so my mother, you moms out there, saving lives, calls me up and she said, I know you're struggling, um, so can you do a painting for me like you did in high school? And she, my mom still has my art from 1982 hanging on the walls in her house. And so I got mad at her, and I'm like, okay, I'll paint. And so I did. Went out in the garage, and I painted for like 12, 13 hours. And just, um, I've had 14 back operations, a hip replacement, four knee operations. For me to stand for 13 hours is pretty tough. Um, but I did. And then I went and collapsed. And when I woke up, I'm like, man, that was amazing. It was just this relief. And so Trish, in seeing this, then was like, we, I want to add to it. I want to do the mindfulness meditation. I want, you know. And so she went and got training on that and got certified. And then we started doing that, just her and I as a couple. And then I was like, man, we got to tell people about this. There is something to this that's so important that we let people know. And that's when Monkey Brain Art was born two years ago. Uh, we've put hundreds of warriors through our classes already, uh, working with the VA, the American Legion, Humana. Um, just so many great people have gotten behind this because it's necessary. It's needed. We have, you know, people 20 years of war that we've got a generation that has been hurt. And so uh, it's our mission, Trish and I, besides being grandparents, to reach out and work with veterans and first responders, helping them find their calm. So uh, I want to thank Emma for having us here today. I want to thank all of you for being here today. If you have any questions about monkey brain, please let me know. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Gary. Great story. I only knew some of that before. All right, up next for our speaker program is Shannon Danley. She's a post-9-11 U.S. Marine Corps veteran. 
Her transition story includes coming home after five years of service, starting a new chapter with family, until natural disaster struck, which caused her to move back to greater Kansas City. She became a massage therapist and is now a healthcare professional supporting veterans in a nonprofit. Shannon, please come up. Let's hear from you. Well, I'm Shannon, obviously. Um, let's just start at the beginning. I'm a military brat that just happened to be the oldest daughter of a long line of Marines. And so um, we come from probably four generations of child serving immediately after their parent. Um, and so growing up, um, my dad being as patient as he was that uh, having all girls, um, he would kind of nudge hey you ever thought about the military I'm like you're funny I'm gonna go be a dolphin trainer like normal girls um so you know <laughs> um this is my sister in the audience so I didn't know um that you were gonna be here so that's awesome so we we would joke growing up be like oh that'd be funny if you joined the marines like no you join the marines and so towards the end of high school we're like okay so is this really gonna happen and so I'll go if you go, and then we just kind of kept calling each other's bluff, and the next thing we know, we're in the recruiter's office, and he's like, what are you doing with your life? And I was a beach bum, because my dad got stationed in Hawaii, and like a normal person, I ran away from high school in Overland Park to go do my senior year, where I knew no one to go be a dolphin trainer and live on the beach, but um, the recruiter's like, what are you doing with your life? And like nothing I work at subway part-time and I don't even own my own car he's like perfect he's like what would you want to do I said whatever you do do not put me behind a desk well they put me behind a desk so I got to do supply admin um, and normal supply people think oh you know you got some cool gear you got some cool bags no I got to check serial numbers on copy machines um, and I got to make sure that the historical tanks that were on base at 29 Palms did not move from the last time I checked them three months prior. Um, it was not a lot of fun, but I kept telling myself, someone has to do it. This job's important to somebody, otherwise it wouldn't be a job. Um, and after about four years of still being at 29 Palms, um, they were like, okay, you've been patient. We're gonna push you into purchasing and contracting. I'm like, yes, this is gonna be fun. They told me stories, you're the one that r runs around with a backpack on deployments and it's filled with money. And anytime anyone needs a job done, you open up that backpack and you just hand out money and everything happens for you. I'm like, that sounds like an awesome job. So I said, sign me up. So they put me in purchasing and contracting and I'm with a bunch of civilians, no other Marines. And they're like, we have a great contract for you to manage. I said, all right, let me have it. They're like, you're gonna manage the portable toilet contract for Camp Wilson for pre-deployment training. It's like, again, it needs to be done. I will take it, fine. So I got to be in charge of the $3 million contract that was every three months to make sure the portable toilets were cleaned and not exploded by pilots, which actually happened one time. <laughs> so my experience in the military was it was not exactly uh, a normal experience, but um, I still crack up at some of the things that I got to go through. Um, and being at 29 Palms was my second time there because my dad was stationed there growing up, so I got to go there twice. So I don't know how, is there a badge of honor for that? Because I, I deserve one, there should be. Um, so five years, um, they tell me, okay, you have orders to go do supply for um, OCS training in Quantico. I said, ooh, okay, again, sounds interesting, but I'm not falling for it this time. I'm going to just get out now because this hasn't really been very exciting for me. Um, so uh, my husband at the time and our two little small children, we moved to Houston, Texas. All of his family's there. My family is spread to the winds because military family literally all over the world at this point. So we, I do the stay home mom thing. I thought the Marines was hard. No, three children and diapers. That was an experience. Um, so I was doing the stay home mom thing, um, decided to dabble into getting back into school. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was looking at 
physical therapy, occupational therapy, anything to kind of give back to people that just needed to be healthy again. Um, so in 2017, um, the stay home mom family thing kind of crumbled apart. Um, my marriage fell apart. Um, I was facing a crossroads, so I was like, all right, I get to start all the way over again, so here I go. So spring of 2017, I'm, I'm working for a great company, and it takes veterans, and it put them, puts them through an apprenticeship program, and I'm in charge of 240 veterans and reporting to the Department of Labor for VA so they can collect their GI Bill. Very stressful job. Um, and then Hurricane Harvey hits. My car gets flooded. I'd only had it for two months. Um, my apartment, thankfully, didn't flood, but after the apartment complex was condemned, they said, oh, the city will be here in five days to throw away everything that's in your apartment. You need to move out. And I said, I have no car. They're like, we don't care. You got to get your stuff out. So my kids and I, their school flooded. I have no car. Uh, we were homeless for a month, living with a coworker with bags of clothes, uh, some of their toys, and everything that I could manage to get out of my apartment was in a storage unit, and I was just like, well, now what? I get to start over again. So like any normal adult, I call my mom, Mommy, uh, I need a little help, please. And she's like, ah, of course, come back. And so we load as much as I could salvage out of the, the storage unit into a U-Haul. We move up here, and we started all the way over again. Um, and so I was very fortunate that my mother took us in. We camped out in her basement for eight months until I could save up some money for my own place to stay. Um, but my mom um, has a nonprofit. And so this nonprofit uses horses to help with uh, counseling sessions for veterans and first responders. Um, and being up here, I'm like, oh, do you, do you need help cleaning or whatever it is? I just, I need, to, I need busy work. And so um, naturally growing up in Overland Park, I, I don't ride horses, so I wanted nothing to do with these animals. They're giant. They, their jaws are over the top of my head. They're just very overwhelming and intimidating. So no, I will not ride them. But I will scoop the stuff that comes out of them, no problem. <laughs> So after um, actually three years of volunteering and just helping with the horses, I started to notice the difference in the clients, how the eye contact would change, how their posture would change. Um, and I really, really wanted to jump on to that experience. So in 2000, no, 2021, I actually got certified to be a part of the treatment team, so I am actually a part of the nonprofit for that part, for helping the clients go through their eight-week counseling program. Um, and then I also do the corrective body work because um, after I moved here, I was looking for the fastest way to get a credential of any kind to where I could make money anywhere on the planet that I lived because I was very used to just being moving quite a bit, and that was through massage therapy. So it was a, a quick nine-month program. The GI Bill paid for it, so now I use my massage therapy and we also apply that as one of our alternative therapies through the nonprofit for any of the clients that come through for their, their counseling sessions. Um, if it's, you know, veterans, bad knees, bad back, you name it. Um, so I also try to give back with the massage therapy as well. Um, I feel like I just talked for 30 minutes and I know it wasn't. <laughs> but that's it. Thank you so much for coming out. I appreciate it. All right, very good. Thank you so much, Shannon. All right, our next speaker is Sean Quigley, also a post 9-11 US Marine Corps veteran. His transition story includes coming home after 23 years of active duty service as a helicopter pilot, going into risk and crisis management consulting, discovering the importance of workplace culture, and becoming an entrepreneur in supporting training and leader development. Sean, please come up and let's hear from you. I, uh, unfortunately, I've got a few hours logged in the porta potties at Camp Wilson, and that's a, it is a miserable, oh no, I, yeah, as far as I know, um, miser miserable place, I, I sympathize. Um, 
three things to take away when we're done, when I'm done. Um, when we talk about transition, uh, and I retired in 2015, so now I feel like I can authoritatively, I guess, talk about some of it. Uh, nobody is on your timeline. Transition is like fishing. You gotta cast that line out there a whole bunch of times, and you don't know if you're throwing it in the right spot, if you got the right bait on it, if you, the hook's at the right depth, and you sure as heck don't know when you're gonna get a bite. That's transition. Uh, and the third thing, there's, there's this industry that sprung up around transition since 2000, well, since 9-11, basically, I, at least what I've seen. Um, resources, webinars, conferences, consulting firms, uh, books, on and on and on. All kinds of great stuff to help the veteran in transition. Some of the best advice I got early on in mine was just spend time listening. Listen to the people you're talking to and listen to the dumb stuff you say. You're going to learn more from those two events than you probably will from reading uh, or other things like that. I haven't necessarily found that to be true, but I tuck it in the back of my head and I share it with other people. Procrastinators? Anybody in here? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, you guys are lying. Uh, I decided my transition was going to be the first time I don't write the term paper the night before it's due. Uh, now, everybody gets a stamp on their DD-214. It's got a date on it. Uh, the way I see it, I'm turning in that term paper on that day, but it's a draft, and I'm going to keep editing it as I go, and I have, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, in the summer of 1986, a very important cinematic event occurred. Anybody remember? Oh, thank you. Absolutely. I live in this little small town in South Carolina, one movie theater, one screen, and there's this young lady I wanted to take to see it, so we did. Uh, two hours later, I come out of that thing, and I am smitten. Oh, heavens. Not with her, she was pretty nice. But naval aviation, jets, going Mach 2 with your hair on fire. Now, if I had hair like that, I'd be a little worried about it, Gary. But oh, goodness gracious, I thought this was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. I, could, I, I didn't wake anybody up when I got home that night, but I had a hard time sleeping. I thought, this is fantastic. Um, fast forward five, seven, seven years later, I graduate from the Naval Academy with a commission, and I'm a Marine. I'm going to be a Marine. Um, long story on why I ended up there, but I'm going to be a Marine. I'm going to flight school, uh, and I am going, I'm, I'm going to get those wings. This is, this is it. This is what it's all about. Um, fast forward through a career, two years at flight school, five years flying uh, helicopters uh, in the fleet, doing a couple of deployments to the Med, a bunch of other operations. Uh, I spent a year as a Ford Air Controller at Reconnaissance Battalion. I spent three years teaching Naval ROTC at the Citadel in South Carolina. I spent four years flying the green helicopters with the white tops that land in the fancy places in Washington, D.C., if you know what I'm talking about. Um, I spent three years overseas in Okinawa, where I actually spent more time in the Philippines, Guam, and Korea uh, than Japan, and then finished up three years at the Marine Corps Training and Education Command in Quantico, which doesn't sound like much fun, but for the Army, it's TRADOC, for the Navy, it's NETC, and I don't know what we call it in the Air Force. Um, at any rate, those last three years, I decided this is when I'm going to not write the term paper the night before it's due. And so I took the transition course three times. I'm a, I'm a Marine pilot. I understand the importance of the book and what the book says and following the procedure, so give me the book, give me the class, I'll do it. Uh, I did it three times. I even paid for it one time afterwards. Um, and I, I took it all to heart. Networking, job fairs, resume, LinkedIn profile, I did it all. I sent my wife and kids away for a weekend. I spread all my OERs, where my fitness reports out, my awards, and I wrote my resumes, and I built a LinkedIn profile, and I did all that stuff, and then I started networking. Coffee, breakfast, lunch, PT in the afternoon, let's play golf, tennis, cornhole, I don't care. I'll talk to you, all right? I, I want to pick your brain. I want to listen. <sighs> And it got a little frustrating. In between, I was doing job fairs. I was prepping for job fairs, and I was building resumes, and I was passing them out, and I was talking to people, and I was listening, and this frustration was building. And I came home one day, and I just, because I've been at this for months, and I kind of had my head in my hands, and my wife said, what is wrong with you? And I said, I'm frustrated. I'm, I'm doing the playbook. I'm doing everything they've told me to do. And it's not working. I'm not getting the interviews I wanted. And she said, for heaven's sakes, have you ever have you applied for anything? And applied. 
you haven't sat through the, the transition course three times. It's all about networking. That's what's really important. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. <clears throat> My wife who left the job force like 20 years prior, no, just apply. Well, two weeks later, one week later, I get a call out of the blue, out of the blue from a, recruit, uh, from a recruiter at Deloitte Consulting, Deloitte, great big firm, uh, 156,000 people just in the U.S., 300,000 worldwide, three times as big as the Marine Corps. Um, and remember what I said about fishing? I got to throw that net and you never know what's, yeah. And nobody's on your timeline. Um, a 30 minute conversation, 90 minutes later, we're hanging up. And I said, I just got an, oh, and that's a Wednesday afternoon, and I'm signed up to go do three interviews on Friday. I said, how'd you find me? And she said, I pulled your resume out of a stack of 100 from a job fair. Right? Um, <clears throat> so I go to the interview. I end up getting hired. Fast forward through my time at Deloitte. What was important about that is I discovered that all this talk and all these books and all these consultants and webinars and conferences that talk about the importance of culture in an organization are not making it up. I discounted it in a way, not because I didn't believe it, but because I thought, I'm a Marine. I, I can endure any kind of culture problem. How bad can it be? I come from one of the greatest cultures ever, right? I will just rise above. Well, it got to be mm, more of a thing than I realized. And about three years into it, I come home one evening, and my wife says, you have not been right since you left the Marine Corps. Well, I didn't know. I thought I was hiding it. I didn't know it was bothering me that much. Um, and it it got me started on a path of I need to go do something else. Um, in the course of that time, we moved back here to DC, or we moved here to Kansas City. Um, that was 2019, I think, four years ago, 18. Um, we moved here to Kansas City because we could. Deloitte, let me do it. I fly back to DC every two weeks, um, and I was doing that miserable commuting thing that I thought I would never do. Um, and then COVID hit. Remember, and things really started unraveling then. And I realized this culture thing is important enough that I want my own. And in order to have my own, I got to have my own business. I'd been terrified of entrepreneurship. I wanted nothing to do with that. I was very comfortable with security, benefits, all that kind of stuff. And Deloitte was way more Gucci than I was ever, than I was comfortable with, number one, um, and more than I expected. Um, Early on, if you'd asked me, hey, Sean, what do you want to do? I just said, I, I don't know. What do you need me to do? Uh, and if you said, well, what do you want out of the job? I just said, get paid, vacation, maybe a phone. Well, I'd learned along the way there's way more to it than that. And what I wanted now was to be a contributor, to be a follower, and to be a leader, to learn new things to gain new skills, to actually feel every day and every week like I'm accomplishing something. Uh, that was important revelation and important change from as I stepped out. And as a transition lesson, I thought that was really important to me at the time. Um, at any rate, in order to get my own business, my own culture, uh, I decided to buy a small business. I looked at a bunch of brick and mortar possibilities right here in Kansas City. As COVID hit, I realized, goodness gracious, all this stuff's bolted to the floor. We're stuck. We're all locked down. Um, this is not good. I need something portable. So I started looking at services and uh, ended up buying a business coaching franchise. Um, already in hindsight, decided that was not the best move either because I jumped into it. For once in my life, I took this horribly risky move. I'm not risky. And I decided quickly it was not quite right. Uh, and I've shifted uh, to independent consulting, leadership management, because I'm comfortable with that. And I know what to talk about. And I don't have to do it for somebody else. Nobody's on your timeline. Transition's like fishing. Resources are great, but listening is key. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Great remarks there, Sean. And last but not least for our transition story speakers is Andrew Marks, a post 9-11 Army veteran. 
His transition story includes coming home after a bar to reenlistment due to height and weight standards, several years of low motivation and discipline, which prompted a decision for change. He lost over 120 pounds and returned to military service via officer candidate school and is now managing dual careers as a field artillery second lieutenant in the Missouri National Guard and is a freight broker for a local transportation company. Andrew, please come up. Let's hear from you. I don't really know how to follow behind a Marine Naval Academy pilot. So as an artillery guy, we pull a string, go boom, make a grid square disappear. But you know. So that's true. That's true. As long as we can clear air and ground, we're good. Uh, so, well, another thing that I want to focus about and talk about being an officer, I'll talk about myself a little bit, try not to do that too much. So growing up, I always wanted to be, be an officer. Um, my dad was a Vietnam vet. I was, I was a surprise, surprise kid. I have older, older parents. But um, I uh, remember the only thing I want to do, I want to go to West Point. I want to make my dad proud. I wanted to go and you know, make, my, make my family proud, be an Army officer. They ended up getting my ACT score. They said, thanks for trying. Thanks for applying. Have you tried the Naval Academy yet? Said no. I'm going to go play baseball instead. So I ended up going to the University of Minnesota. I did ROTC for about a year and a half. I enlisted. did a program called SMP where you are enlisted. And at the same time, you're doing officer training. I was like, you know what? I get to go to basic training. I get to learn about you know, what my guys are going to do someday. Let's do that. I walked into, the, walked into MEPS. They said, hey, you got to take the, this, this long test. It's like the uh, ACT. I'm like, great. That didn't go so well the first time. Let's see what happens now. I went in. I ended up getting a 98 on it out of 99. So I was like, cool. They're like, sky's the limit. Whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do in the Army. I'm like, honestly, I'm going to be an officer, so it doesn't really matter what I pick now. So I had a couple of choices. Like, you can be a 13 Foxtrot forward observer. I'm like, cool. Let's do that. How long is it? Six weeks long. I'm like, sweet. It was the shortest option that I had because I knew that I wasn't going to go infantry. I was told to go infantry. Just don't do it. Okay, cool. Came back from basic training. Had a great time in South Carolina for 12 weeks. Came back to ROTC. I'm like, this officer thing. No, I'm good. I'm going to be enlisted and have a great time. Ended up going to AIT and I ended up I lost my baseball scholarship. I came and graduated college, had a bachelor's degree, enjoyed being enlisted for six years. I was a 13 Fox. Tried to deploy. I volunteered seven times to deploy in six years. Not once got selected. So ended up like most men do. We get married. Our wives are fantastic cooks. Stop working out. Stop caring. You just kind of, your uniform size goes from a small extra short to a large long. Height and weight comes around. They're like, what's happening? Well, she's a really good cook. My bad. I, I know I can't blame my wife for everything when it comes to, to, to that point. But I will never forget, though, we, we had an opportunity. We got to sit down. I hit my six years. Like, hey, do you want to stay in? you want to get out? I'm like, I'd like to extend for a year. We'll just see what happens. I'm kind of burnt out. I became an NCO twice. And they said, you know what? I will never forget. This is when my platoon sergeant goes, we don't have enough room for you in the U.S. military. It's time for you to leave. I'm like, bye. I'm out. Ended up getting out, and I did what any reasonable veteran does. You buy everything from Grunstyle. You grow your hair out. You just stop caring. Yeah. The second you walked in, I'm like, enlisted. I got you, bro. Ended up, uh, I will never forget, though, it was, it was 2018. I remember sitting on my couch, and I had, had some, I, I just remember sitting on my couch, and my, I was cold. And I went, and I walked in, I opened my closet. I still had my, my ACUs hanging up. I just didn't, have, just didn't have the heart to get rid of them. And I remember looking at them, and I pushed them through, across. I'm like, you know what? I wonder if I could still fit. Pulled that puppy off, and maybe got to here on each side. And I just remember at that point looking down, and I'm like, what happened, man? This isn't you. Like, you had no discipline. You've just stopped caring. 
And that's kind of when a little a little light bulb in my head went off. I'm like, you remember back in the day when you were this young and dumb kid? You wanted to be an officer. You wanted to join the military. You had goals. You had aspirations. Like, what happened? Where did it go? And that's kind of how I'm going to tie into this, this transition. I had a really good heart-to-heart -heart with myself that night. And that was right when this, this fad diet came out called the keto diet. <laughs> One of my buddies did. He's lost like 15 pounds. He's like, dude, I live off of like bacon and cheese and coffee. I'm like, <laughs> bro, for real? And you're losing weight? He's like, yeah, man. I'm like, sign me up. <laughs> Burn like 10 pounds off in about a week and a half. I'm like, this is wild. 20 turned into 25. 25 turned into 50. And I never forget, I went to the gym. I'm like, I'm going to get on the treadmill. Let's see what's happening there. Let's see if I can even do two miles. It took me 27 minutes. All the Marines are like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> There's Army low and then, like, Army low. But I will never forget, I walked to my car, and I bawled my eyes out. Because it was another light switch. It's like, dude, what happened? And I remember I told myself, I'm going to run. Not even run. If I can't run, I'm going to jog it. If I can't jog it, I'm going to walk it. If I can't walk it, I'm going to crawl two miles every single day. And about a year and a half in, I lost about 100 pounds. And similar to Top Gun, we went to the air show. I got to go to, J I got to, go to JFO school when I was in the Army, getting to be on the ground and getting to call in the A-10s and, and, and all the rotor wings. I remember they had the A-10s here. And I'm like, oh, I miss this so much. My wife, she goes, so go to the recruiting office. I'm like, no. Well, long story short, the next day she, she's a night nurse. She woke up the next morning to a selfie of me in front of the recruiting office. And kind of fast forwarding a little bit, I ended up coming back in. I went to OCS. 18 months long of sh sheer happiness and joy. It was great sending 22 lieutenants to Fort Lost in the Woods to do land nav. <laughs> what could go wrong? But at the end of the, end of the day, we started with 32 candidates, and this was during COVID. 32 candidates, we had 16 graduate. I was on top honor grad, and I got high PT for my class. And I was 10 years older than the next oldest person, so I got to beat all those little kids sad but anyways so kind of bring it into you know so what it, what can I learn how can I identify with kind of his story is how do you go from I can't do it to exceeding the standard how do I beat out other people how do I stand above my peers and the biggest piece of advice I can have, and, I, and this is why I like running as an example. I was never a track athlete, never have, never will, never going to run cross country. How do I go from running a 27 minute two mile to running a 1232 mile? Because when you think about it, like, oh my gosh, how do you do that? So many times we focus on the competition. We focus on, oh, well, that person's business is bigger than mine. That person can run faster than I can. That person's smarter than me. That person had opportunities that I don't have. We oftentimes get so caught up on everybody else's story and everybody else's problems, we don't stop to think about, okay, let's get rid of all these distractions and focus on me. Going back when I said, I'm going to run two miles every day. I don't care about my time. I don't care about what all these other people are doing. All I care about is that I went just a little bit faster than how I did yesterday. Because when you think taking 15 minutes off a of run time sounds insane. But if you focus on taking five seconds off, it's a lot more doable, right? It's anything else in our life. We focus so much on other people. And we have to focus. I have probably, I have ADD real bad sometimes it feels like. I'm looking at everything. Focus on one thing. Focus on one goal. Figure out smaller goals that you can accomplish to get to that main goal. And also hold yourself accountable. I think it's the hardest part. I worked in insurance for a hot minute, and it was terrible. I was not built for cold calling at all. But 
make sure that whatever we're doing, we're holding ourselves accountable, that we are meeting those, those goals that we set for ourselves. Make sure that we are doing things that are putting us out of our comfort zone. That's the other thing, too. We, we like to oftentimes keep ourselves comfortable. Oh, I'm only going to go to these networking, with, but only with people that I like. I'm going to show up to these things, but I'm only going to network with the people I've already networked with. That completely negates the entire what we're doing. Get yourself outside of your comfort zone because that's the only way you're going to grow. And then lastly, and this is the big thing, and, I, and again, I use running. Do something hard, something that you hate, and get really freaking good at it. Find something that you absolutely despise and do it over and over again until you not necessarily love it or like it, but you're good at it. So I wish you all the, the best of luck, you know, whatever business you're business in. I hear the little alarm is telling me I need to be quiet now. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Andrew, for your remarks. All right. Now that we've heard from our guest speakers in their transition stories, I'm going to talk a little bit about how a military transition is like a jigsaw puzzle. In their stories, you may have seen this picture kind of might have represented where they were. It was a mess of pieces. And what is it supposed to look like for what's next? Transition is a process, whether it's from the military or something in life, school, career, or business. And this paradigm of solving the transition puzzle, this is at the center of the work that I do as a strengths profile practitioner and an academic and career transition coach. Solving the transition puzzle requires five elements. It's a forward-facing picture with two edges focused on your identity and purpose, and then two edges that are focused on the environment and the routines for where you show up, where you perform actions, and you get assessed for success. Having clear definitions and a semblance of clarity in these five elements provides you focus, and it enables your intentional ability to do actions and have efficiency in how you uh, go through that transition. A picture is a vision of your goal. It's your objective. It's your mission. It's your outcome that you want to create and have be real. You're taking steps to achieve it. Putting a frame around it with some clearly defined edges gives you known points for reference. And it allows you to focus so that you apply your resources and energy on purpose. Not having a clear picture is OK, but you got to have a frame around it. Otherwise, it really is nothing but random. The picture starts to come together as you encounter pieces. And those pieces could be people. It could be information. It could be advice that they have given you. It could be opportunities. But how do you decide if it belongs in your picture or not unless you have a basis of comparison, and that is your frame? You either discard those pieces that you decide don't fit, or you put the ones that are relevant towards completing your picture. Because of those known points for reference and your focus on your vision, the intended completed outcome of your picture and those defined edges. Something to note about the picture is that your reality isn't necessarily what you envision. You've heard it from our speakers, the plan doesn't always become what's real. But what becomes real is what the frame supports. So what do I mean by this? I'll explain. The first edge is personal identity. Who are you? This can be a difficult question for people who are in transition because a lot of the time that is based on who they are at the present. To move on to the next thing, you focus on the future you. Who are you going to become by applying your current skills, your talents, your experience, your values, and what resources you have available? What of your current self can be applied to a future career, 
for work that you have done in the past, right? To achieve an outcome or result that you want to be able to say yes, and you can promise it on delivery. I promise I can, and I will, because I have in the past, or I've been trained, and I'm going to do it for you, or because I'm willing to grow and do better and become that person you need. The second edge is purpose. Why? Why do you want the picture that you envision? Let's say it's a certain vision for a career. Just because you can do something in work doesn't mean you should. <laughs> you can choose because you live in America. You have the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, whatever that is for you. What work do you really want to do? What drives you? What makes you happy? What makes you proud? Where do you have your confidence and your energy? Your purpose should be emotional. Because sometimes what we want isn't rational or practical or maybe even yet attainable for the resources that we currently have. But people are driven by emotions, and they justify their decisions through logic. Think about what your purpose is because it is your energy battery. A strong enough purpose will keep you taking steps to get closer to what it is that you say that you want, even if the situation, the environment, the circumstances that you are in are crappy. <laughs> and you heard some of our stories. How you get what you want is by being resourceful. And you continue to put forth the necessary energy and you attain access to the resources that you need to keep going after it. But solving the transition puzzle isn't just about you. There are two other edges to this frame. The third edge is the environment. Life doesn't happen in your head. A vision and a plan are not what necessarily become your reality. The vision and the plan, they play out. When you show up, actions are made, resources are applied, and it may not play out the way you intend. And you think about it, what plan ever does? When you show up with only what you have for rules and behavior and what you already know to achieve your goals, you may or may not get there. They may not be as you intend. Your values and belief are what guide your behavior, your performance, and your measures for success. But if your expectations for those things don't line up with the environment that you are showing up in, are you assessed to be successful? Are you the one who is right? Are you fitting in and normal against those environmental standards. At the end of the day, and we all know this because we've all been in the field, it's the environment that rules. How are, you, how are you showing up in it? Do you know enough? Do you have the right resources? Can you create access to the knowledge and opportunities because of people that you know? The fourth edge is routines. This is where life happens. And this is where things get real. This is not where just ideas and because I said so, concepts and empty space. Showing up to the expectations of the environment requires you to know what is the routine for those who live and play and work. And they show up every day in confidence and success in that space. But how do you learn the routine if you aren't already familiar with it. You got to meet people, the people who are the natives in that space. They're used to it. They don't have to think about it. You learn from them. And this is why networking is, is so important when you're in transition. You show up every day the way you always have, 
Are you communicating in the way you need to? Are you behaving in the way that's expected? Are you doing the work in the way that they intend for you to? Are you going to engage with people in the most effective way or be efficient and measure up to be that high-level performer that you have in your own mind that you are? What are the measures of performance and success in that environment that you are now showing up in? And do you meet those expectations by those who would be the judge? Because it may not be you. You may think you're being successful, but are you, really? Life doesn't happen in your head. It happens and is real when things happen. When you show up, apply resources, and you get assessed against the standards of that environment that you are showing up in and its, rot and its routines. Transition is a process, and everyone goes through it. And whether it's short or long, easy or hard, it just kind of depends. As I said before, this paradigm of solving the transition puzzle it's at the center of my work as a strengths profile practitioner and as a academic and career transition coach. The more clarity that you have in these five elements, the more focused, intentional, efficient, and probably successful you're going to be in getting on to what is next, whether it's a transition in life, school, career, or business. Where in this process might you be undecided? maybe lack some confidence or lack clarity? Is it in one or more of these areas if you are in a transition process right now? Tubes Consulting, American Warriors, the Purple Connection, and the military support com community that we all are part of offers resources that can help you to address transition. Those challenges help you accelerate through them that process is a process, but the steps can be taken at speed when you're paired up with people who know what you might be going through. So connect with us and let us help you. Refer the support to those that you know who need it. Life doesn't happen in your head. It plays out in the space you show up in when you act and apply resources. All right. Now we're going to move on to the recognition segment of the program. I introduced our sponsor companies earlier, and now I'm going to recognize two of them as sustaining sponsors and present them with a gift. A sustaining sponsor is one that has contributed continuing support to American Warrior events and also actively promotes other programs and activities that further our mission to provide educational and networking opportunities to patriotic business leaders and those in transition from service. Lucas and Associates has sponsored two of our American Warrior Socials and Guest Speaker Program events thus far. Kathy Lucas is their CEO and has been a longtime participant of the American Warriors and a uh, participant in uh, the Purple Connection. Kathy, please come up. I have a gift for you. It is an essential storage tote personalized with the U.S. flag and the words American Warriors. You know, get you up here. And it is a gift from the sponsor of my company, Thank Gem you. Gifts by Emma. Thank 31 you. gifts. I love it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Our next sustaining sponsor recognition is to Brand and Go. Stacy Neal is the owner of Brand and Go and has greatly supported American Warriors, Tubes Consulting, and the Purple Connection with her creative talent. She redesigned the logos for American Warriors and the Purple Connection and was part of the website development team that redesigned our Tubes Consulting website, which also includes a community page for the Purple Connection. Stacy, please come up. I've got a gift for you, too. Thank you so much for your support of the program. All right, continuing on with recognitions, 
I'd like to have each of the transition story speakers to please come up. We would not have a guest speaker program without you. <laughs> All right. Each of you are receiving a trio set of um, luggage cases. So basically, there's three different sizes of um, uh, cases in here. Use these in helping organize, organizing yourself in your future travels in life, school, career, or business. Thank you so much for your participant effort. Thank you for sharing your stories with us. Those were all really great. All right, now I'll recognize the event team without whom we could not have done this event. This venue is the Shawnee ACA Club, uh, ACA Business Club. So we want to thank Ann D'Angelo, who is the general manager of the facility. Our program production team is uh, brought to you by Gary on the camera. BJ, the DJ, and sound. <laughs> David on the computer, and me as your MC. Our sponsor representatives who provided support for our operational expenses, gifts, um, which we'll get to here in a second, food and drink, and event operations are Sharon K. Keller with Keller Williams Realty Partners and the Mission Hills chapter of the DAR, Jim Meadows with Park Place Payments, Kathy Lucas with Lucas and Associates, Stacy Neal with Branding Go, Derek Keller with Exit Momentum, Shane Loya with Prime Lending, Gary Ott with the Castle on a Hill Productions, BJ Taylor with BJ Productions, David and I with Tubes Consulting, and me with Gem Gifts by Emma 31 Gifts. We also want to thank the members of the American Warriors Interest Group for their support and participation in today's events and in other activities through the year. <clears throat> we want to acknowledge and thank the community as well. You are the community natives who are confident and successful in how you show up every day. You're a significant resource and you may not even realize it. You too can help in the transition process. How are some ways that you can participate? You can become a member of the ACA Business Club and become part of the American Warriors Interest Group. Some of the many benefits of the club is we've got five club locations here in greater Kansas City. We also have clubs all across the country. American Warriors is only one of over 20 interest groups. And if you are intentionally building your business, you can join a business development team. There are events every week local and virtual, networking as well as learning, opportunities for you to engage at whatever level that you have bandwidth for. And there's also opportunities to step up into leadership as far as being a group leader, uh, team leader, or uh, interest group. American Warriors Monthly Meeting is every fourth Thursday for a discussion roundtable, except for February and August where we do this social and guest speaker program. All attendees contribute to the conversation with a perspective on the topic of discussion. American Warriors are encouraged to invite friends, community partners, transitioning service people as guests to benefit from and to contribute to the discussion. The discussion topics for March will be on personal and professional growth, feedback, uh, relationships, and motivation are some of the subtopics that will be part of that roundtable. This event can be attended in person at the Overland Park Club or virtually via Zoom. You can also become part of the Purple Connection community. This is a monthly educational networking event that David and I organize, host, and sponsor. It helps to create awareness, enable access, and encourage action between those who are in transition and the community who can and wants to support them. It is every third Thursday at 4.30 to 5.30 Central, and it is on Zoom. Program topic next month is our furry family. And our speakers there, we've got a military spouse entrepreneur who is a canine listener. Her business is called uh, Canine Instincts. We have the executive director of the nonprofit Warrior's Best Friend and Mark Clausen, who is the director of business development for Icon Structures. 
Every program, I provide a short segment of transition tips related to the topic of the day. Check out our transition services at our website if you're not familiar with our work. The Purple Connection is the community part of our veteran transition assistance pillar, but we do offer individualized support as well. The Purple Connection does have an online presence, so you can go to thepurpleconnection.com. It lands you on the community page of our website. You can use this to refer people to become part of the community, get on our distribution list for our event announcements, or to refer them to the community as far as transition support. You can contact me for any question that you may have about our work, the various ways to get involved, and of course, the events that are always ongoing. Connect with me on LinkedIn as you like, and please come to a future ACA club event as my guest. If you want to receive uh, future emails for events or access the program recording, make sure that we have your email address. Any veterans who are interested in participating in a future event as a speaker, and then businesses or individuals who are looking to maybe participate in a future event as part of the event team or as a sponsor, just let us know you are interested and we will follow up with you. Thank you for your attention. This is the um, end of the formal program. Thank you so much for being here, everyone.